To some degree, you're asking a question about process and product. Uh, the process of uh, commissioning a piece of architecture, uh, analyzing a site, uh, understanding the many constituencies that come to bear on programming, uh, forecasting construction complexities, all of that uh, are, are realities that weigh in on a, on a project, but not all of them take priority at the same time. Uh, so to some degree, finding ways uh, of making designers into their own best critics is one of the key imperatives that we have to undertake uh, because they have to make critical choices, some of them weighing in on ethical issues, ideological matters. It's often the case also that uh, complexity is not just part of the process, but how the uh, architectural emanations end up uh, being petrified through the building. Uh, it's spatial, formal, and, and material consequences, uh, if you like, are an index of that complexity. I think uh, if we overcome the false dichotomy of art and science uh, and begin to measure architecture in broad and cultural terms, only then will we see how uh, art and science are already in dialogue with each other uh, and then come to understand how we pose and prioritize certain questions in the formation of the building of the city. I would say that our uh, initial focus on materials research was prompted by the fact that uh, architecture during my generation was studied purely through its abstraction and questions of construction, uh, labor and materiality were postponed to the construction documentation and the administration of its construction. Uh, almost as if they were administrative aspects of, of architecture. We brought the question of materiality to the forefront uh, in the schematic phases, in the conceptual phases of the design, if only to better understand how the entire equation of programming, urbanism, and the many other pressures of architecture may be re-engaged uh, from a material perspective. In turn, they also had to do with the question of culture, iconography, experience, and all of the other things that uh, materials bear on. I'm not sure if it's necessary to draw that boundary. Uh, in so far as architects have a seat uh, at the table of governance, whether that be in Washington, D.C., uh, in New York City, or even within a school, you might have to ask, what is it that architects do that nobody else does? And how can they contribute in asking questions that others, others cannot answer? To the extent that architects are invested in formal, spatial, and material phenomena, and techniques of representation that only we know how to master or expand on, there is something to be said uh, about uh, ways in which we produce data that others cannot. What I do believe in is that the, the great architectures uh, that are out there often comply with certain foundational needs and certain flexibilities that are adaptable to many uses and many historical events that they invariably will have to face uh, as new phenomena becomes apparent. Uh, and the pandemic has exposed that also. At the same time, uh, we are witnessing uh, phenomena in the context of classrooms which I think are really important. And they're not necessarily uh, related to the pandemic per se. Uh, they deal with how we learn and how we teach. 
uh, classrooms are not necessarily driven top down, but are more discursive platforms where students uh, and teachers alike produce new forms of knowledge. So finding the right spaces for collaboration, uh, transformation, uh, and the production of new forms of knowledge is critical to that. With the emergence of China as a global leader, Beijing will become the seat of that power. Um, if we haven't already, we will look to China for global leadership uh, when it comes to questions of governance, public space, uh, the design uh, and governance of cities, and the ways in which architecture can participate in the creation of civic spaces, both symbolic and quotidian. Um, that puts a lot of pressure on, on Beijing uh, to behave uh, like no other city in the world. We are looking to China inevitably because of its economic power, because of its social might, there is no country with that population outside of India that will bear the responsibility of growth and urbanization uh, with an understanding of how architecture and urbanism come into conversation uh, around questions uh, of public engagement uh, and the absorption of societal needs. Uh, this is going to be a great challenge. I think that the Chinese metropolis of the past 20 years has been operating on the 20th century model with uh, grand projects of infrastructure uh, coming to the big cities and the countryside, connecting uh, cities at, with networks of trains, of highways. Uh, and much of this infrastructure has invaded the city, dismembering local communities, uh, displacing old neighborhoods, and forgetting its own history. Uh, one of the great challenges, uh, if China seeks to reconsider those positions is how to localize uh, these grand projects and how to imagine the role of the community and its participation in the formation uh, of the very cities that may require completely different uh, environments, uh, cultures, uh, customs, uh, and rituals. And we well know that with the girth uh, and the geographic might of China, uh, there are huge differences between the north, the south, the east, and the west. Uh, and so it, it will require uh, a kind of cultural tolerance to deal with the diversification that it, it has and it bears within it.